evening, everybody, and hello also to those of you who will be watching this afterwards, um, as all of the sessions in the conference, of course, are being taped and will be made available afterwards. So if you enjoy what you're hearing about today, send a link to other people. Um, it's good to share these ideas as widely as possible. And never have there been um, two people whose ideas have been consciously or unconsciously shared as widely as the two gentlemen that I I'm privileged to be talking with today. Um, Professor John Kay is um, a very distinguished economist, as George mentioned before we had the video, um, but to me he is much more than that. Not only is he the person who developed the model that I wrote my own PhD on, but he is also, above all, a trailblazing Scot and somebody who has led the charge for Scotland in so many areas um, and right across the world. And James Anderson has also done that in a very different way um, from Scotland. Uh, James uh, is, uh, like John, a, a very distinguished person in his own field, in that of investment management. Um, sometimes people are less aware of James than they are of other people, but they certainly should be. This is the man who chose to invest in Tesla in 2012 at $6. People who look this up will say to me, no, 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 it was $30. But of course, Tesla's had a five for one stock split since then. So we know that it was $6, James, and we know that today it's trading at over $400. Um, and that after uh, uh, um, its founder, you know, Musk, uh, James and his funds are the second largest investor in Tesla. Um, the, the thing that, of course, that all of this tells you is about radical uncertainty, because if there's anything uncertain, it's investing in a somewhat wacky um, prospect in 2012 at $6. And it has been a, certainly a rough ride since then um, in terms of uncertainty. And the whole world has been a rough ride since then in terms of uncertainty. And John, of course, has written a book entitled Radical Uncertainty with Mervyn King, um, not the first book he's written with Mervyn King, and not the first book he's written full stop. Um, uh, John is an author of many books. Um, but what both the gentlemen have in common is that they have looked at how do you deal with uncertainty at a time when the science is so unreliable. Um, John's book, recent book with Mervyn King, was reviewed, of course, in the Financial Times, as you would expect. Um, and the, the reviewer at that point pointed out that, you know, this is an excellent book to read when you want to know how do you make policy when the numbers are so unreliable. And never have we had a week in the UK when the numbers have been more unreliable than they have been in the last week. Um, so I'm going to start by uh, asking uh, my panellists to comment on that, to comment on how do you make policy and how do you do anything when the numbers are so unreliable. Um, and uh, I if I could start with you, John, as you know, you did write the book with this great title. You must have seen this coming. Uh, well, yes and no. We're slightly pleased, troke, embarrassed by the fact that on page 40 of the book, we say we must expect to experience a pandemic caused by some virus that does not yet exist. We didn't anticipate that that virus probably existed at the very time we were we were writing that. But this is, COVID, is a very good example of what we mean by radical uncertainty. And it's a good example because we know that events of this kind are likely. Uh, we weren't particularly astute in making that, that statement. But it's impossible to predict when, it's going, when something like that will happen. And no one could have attached a probability to uh, that virus breaking out in Wuhan in December 2019. You can talk about likelihood in these terms, you cannot talk about probabilities, and that's an important distinction. If we go back, George talked about the, the end of the Great War um, in his introduction, and if we go back a hundred years to that time, there, was, there were two books published almost exactly a hundred years ago, in 1921, in fact. One by Maynard Keynes, of whom everyone has heard. It was called A Treatise on Probability. And the other was by an American economist called Frank Knight, who wrote Risk, Uncertainty, and Profit. And what they did was they made a distinction between risk, 
which they suggested could be characterized probabilistically and therefore managed in that way, and uncertainty, which could not. And actually that distinction between risk and uncertainty was elided in the finance world and in the macroeconomic world in the, in the century that followed. We want to try and restore that distinction. Talk about risk and uncertainty. Risk as people talk about it in ordinary life means something bad, but uncertainty can be either good or bad. That was Frank Knight's argument that it's actually uncertainty which is a source of opportunity and potential profit. And that of course takes us back to the theme which um, you raised in talking about Tesla long-term investment and how we actually manage uncertainty in the investment world. Um, well, thank you very much, John. And James, uh, before I turn to you, I, I would say that this, this distinction between risk and uncertainty, one of the things that's very helpful, of course, is numbers, is to have somebody publishing numbers. Um, you are, uh, of course, a trustee of John Hopkins University, and I notice that they have really taken a lead in publishing numbers for people to see how we can track coronavirus around the world. Um, to what extent do you... You know, we, please do comment on what John said and indeed what I asked earlier, but I'd also be interested in to know what numbers do you as an investor look to when you're trying to manage uncertainty? Thanks, Heather. Yes, I, you, you brought up the Johns Hopkins link, which I found fascinating in the course of this year, but just give you a flavour of the degree of uh, <laughs> unpredictability. Um, probably the closest I came to getting COVID so far was when there was Johns Hopkins trustee meeting in New York in the middle of March and we were sat because Mr Bloomberg's usual offer of premises was unavailable for obvious reasons in a very crowded room with uh, I think close to 100 mostly fairly elderly and unhealthy people so you know, I, I wouldn't say that even they can predict this but I, I think that and I hope John would agree with this that over the years in investing at Scottish Mortgage, we've always felt that there was this distinct inability of the normal mantras to capture uh, that differentiation between uncertainty and risk that he's describing. And that the investment industry as a whole has fooled itself into believing that, uh, that you can define risk and you can therefore take it away. But the implications of this are often a different way around than we think. And perhaps John was alluding to this when he mentioning that people think of it as downside. The stock market is dominated by extremes and it's the extreme upside that you need to try and capture. The very, very small percentage of companies produce all the value added by stock markets. And when thinking about that, we try and think about long-term trends. So in the Tesla case, it was the fact that everything from battery technologies to solar power to storage was getting better, even in 2012, it's somewhere between 15 and 25% per annum that mattered to us. We couldn't say when it was going to matter in the economic world, but by having a long-term upside, you were, happy, you were helping yourself in that. All we try and do after that is not really to quantify it so much. We have different scenarios and we can say which ones are getting more likely rather than less likely as we go on. So, so John, hearing uh, that from um, James, I'm very pleased, James, that you didn't get COVID when you went to that trustees meeting in New York. <laughs> I'd say being, being in New York full stop in March would, would have been quite a risk. Um, uh, uh, John, hearing James talk about that, you know, and the, and the importance of investing long term based on, uh, I mean, even that was based on data. It was based on the fact that they could see things improving in, in technology at the rate of 25% a year rather than presumably less than 10% a year that made them think that over the long term this would work. Where, where, what do you think people should be looking to if they're trying to separate risk and uncertainty? Um. I mean, the last thing I want to do is suggest that we, we don't need data. We desperately need data, and the more data we have, the better. Um, uncertainty, as we describe it, is resolvable. If you can either obtain more information, which removes the uncertainty, or if you can describe that uncertainty probabilistically, 
some kind of probability distribution. Mistake which has been made in the, in the century really since Knight and Keynes wrote these books is to think that you can describe everything probabilistically and you can't. If we're looking at the future of, for example, the, the vehicle industry or more broadly, the future of uh, energy technologies, then you can talk about what is likely, you can describe scenarios and the like, but to attach uh, bogus numbers uh, to these is a, is a serious mistake. And the belief that we can quantify everything, that things are not meaningful unless we can attach numbers to them is a, is a great mistake, both in investment and in other aspects of life. We know a great many things we can't quantify. So, John, going back to the, James's point about then the, the investing for the long term, what, what we would be doing by separating risk and uncertainty is separating out investment decisions um, over the long term and saying, well, risk is going to happen anyway, and we'll be much better insulated if we focus on uncertainty. Uh, well, both risk and we need to manage both risk and uncertainty. But as I said earlier, risk is downside. People don't say there's a risk uh, I might win the lottery. They don't even say there's a risk I might not win the lottery because they don't expect really ex realistically expect to, to win the lottery. What people do, and this is how people intelligently think about risk, is they construct for themselves what Mervyn and I describe as a reference narrative. It's not a quantified plan for the future, but it's a story about the future that is coherent and consistent and makes sense, exactly as James was describing in relation to thinking about the, the, the future of vehicles. And then you ask, what are the things that might upset that? What are the risks? You want to ensure that your investment strategy or life strategy is robust and resilient to risks which include things you're not going to be able to anticipate, certainly not in quantitative terms, and perhaps not at all. And if one goes back to what we faced in COVID, uh, many of the problems we have seen uh, arise from the fact that we have strategies that were not robust and resilient to unexpected events. And that's in some ways most, most of all true in the, in the investment world where well, that kind of robustness and resilience has been seen uh, as a source of inefficiency. If you stand back for a moment, it's hard to believe that people can think that banks have surplus capital, too much capital. They really do and did think that. And that's how we got the 2008 crisis. So James, hearing that from John, um, and particularly, as I thought, a very valid point that it was a bit strange that everybody thought at one point banks had too much capital and should return it to shareholders. Um, when you are trying to think about long-term investing, which I know is a cause very close to your heart um, and, um, and which you espouse and the things that you do, how do you try and manage uncertainty over a long term? See, if you're holding something on behalf of your investors over many, many years, how do you go about um, trying to be, trying to resolve, as John puts it, the uncertainty of that investment. I, I think one of the most important elements in this, Heather, is that you need to practice a form of honesty with yourself and your colleagues. And it's critically important, not that you offer to listen to every voice out there, um, but that you have a small number of combination of colleagues and mentors who you can trust on these matters. And, you know, I would link it back to what John was saying about information to on that, that score. Um, I, I think it's not so much that we're looking for more information as that we're looking for better information. And just as, uh, you know, one would read Frank Knight or listen to John in thinking about these matters of risk and uncertainty, uh, to continue with the same example, the information that was valuable to us was to a certain extent building close relations with the companies involved who were seeing these trends, but it was still more to build relations with those academics who were the true experts in these areas rather than listen to the noise in the stock markets. 
So for instance, we spent a lot of time thinking about the work being done at the Santa Fe Institute on the improvement rates of technology as more capital gets implied. And you, can you, you have your hypotheses and you test them in the future. You know, I think that a way of putting it might be uh, the risk is uh, probabilities are about results. Whereas what we are dealing with in likelihoods is about probabilities and you're therefore keep updating those probabilities without in any sense, or sorry, those likelihoods without in any sense becoming too dogmatic about them. My last word would be, I think, and since we're in this, the forum we are, it's worth emphasizing that it is incredibly important to have clients who you can have that open conversation and safe space with you know, as somebody said, you can only be as long term as the least patient of any of your clients. Uh, so what we've tried to do, whether it be with Scottish Mortgage or with Vanguard, is to try and build relations with clients who can think in that long term and can accept your honesty. And if you say there's something we're worried about at Tesla or Illumina or whoever, uh, they won't take it as a sin that somehow you haven't been responsible in a risk sense. They'll take it as the world is unpredictable. So, John, going back to your point that you made before about long term investing as well um, and the importance um, of that. Why do you think the world has not espoused that? Is it, is it because of the, the obsession with quarterly returns or, you, you, you know, or Sitting as an economist looking at these things, what, you know, what would drive better behaviour? Um, I think it is largely this obsession with numbers and short-term performance measurement. Um, another great, a great Scot, um, Lord Kelvin, uh, famously said, "If um, it, unless you can express something in numbers, your knowledge is of a meagre and unsatisfactory kind. Uh, and that was actually engraved on the social sciences business at one of the social science buildings at the University of Chicago. And Knight supposedly passed that and said, but if you, uh, but if you can't express it in numbers, make the numbers up anyway. <laughs> lots of people in, uh, in the century that followed. And we have so much of this, uh, this um, uh, in the investment world people thinking they can resolve uncertainty by inventing numbers of various kinds. And um, you cannot do that. Uh, I'm entirely in favor of numbers. I've spent much of my life developing models of various things. But model, the value of models is to illustrate what might happen rather than to tell you what will happen. Um, and Going back to some of the points that were raised earlier, you know, beyond the numbers then. So, so James, you were talking about building close relationships with the company and the, the intelligence from Santa Fe and so on. Well, you know, what are, what are the value add, if you like, of the investment management community, of the people in the investment management community? Because if, you, if, you, if there is no value add, then it could all be done by trackers or by an algorithm or by, you know, artificial intelligence. So what, what to you as somebody who is leading, um, you know, a group of people investing other people's money, you know, what is the added value of people as opposed to the numbers? Oh, Heather, I, I think that it is absolutely central. Um, I probably, think in terms of what John was saying about the need for data and numbers, that we're constantly trying in that way to only take seriously the data and numbers that give you a high likelihood of success. So when I talk about the improvement rate of those technologies that we're referring to, uh, we probably have a very close to 90% credibility rate in predicting them now from the sources we get and the people we've got to know with them. But I, I think beyond that, it's all the evidence is that for 100 plus years of investing, that it's open-ended opportunities that you need to focus on, ones that you can't actually define in those terms. But you thereby need leaders and people who can embrace those both in investment teams and the companies you're operating. 
So I happen to be just off a Zoom with Daniel Eck of Spotify, who I think embodifies much of this in a, in a pleasingly European fashion. And he was saying that at the start of Spotify's career as a public company, he was very consciously telling both his board and the investment community that he was not running the company for anything other than the long run opportunity. He was completely aware that he was giving up people with trillions of dollars of resources and able to do this because he wanted to revolutionize the music industry. And that to us was much more appealing. Now, I thereby think that he trusts and talks to us and is open about those long term opportunities and transitions in a way that happens with very few people. And I think it's building those relations that, that truly does matter. And I would say you then extend those out into networks uh, because, you know, these people get to know each other and to sympathize with each other. And I think that is just way more important than you can hope to believe. It also gives you the ability to cope with the inevitable down moments. You know, all these truly great companies, the historic record is that their stock price will, if you own them for 10 years, uh, fall by 50% regularly over that period of time. It's only if you have real conviction in those people and what they are trying to build in the long term that you can survive that and persist during that. And all the evidence is persisting matters more than anything in investing. Uh, and John, your view on the beyond the numbers then, you know, I mean, I know that you were saying that, you know, you believe in numbers and you've worked with numbers all your life, but your book points out the fallibility of numbers. So I, I think it, it would be, you know, it's obviously important to have the, the story beyond that. You know, what do you think people should be focusing on? Um, people naturally think in narrative terms rather than probabilistic terms. And it's very important. And the reason they do that, actually, is that the number of situations at which probabilistic type reasoning um, is helpful is not really that many. Uh, it's really where you have what, what physicists call stationary processes or ergodic processes, which are sufficiently stable over time that you can actually construct probability distributions that uh, don't enable you to predict what is going to happen, but enable you to define the range of things that is going to happen. Uh, but most things aren't actually like that. And the way in which you should use numbers and the way in which you should you use models, and I, as I keep repeating, I'm very much in favour of using models, is to give you understanding into the things that matter. Again, if I can go back to COVID, uh, people have developed lots of epidemiological models of various kinds. It's a mistake to use the, these, as people have done, to predict how many people are going to suffer from this illness in three months' time, how many people will die uh, from the disease. What you can use the models for is to understand the kind of things that matter to these outcomes, to see the parameters to which outcomes are sensitive, and then you want to do, devote resources uh, to finding out what these, these numbers are. And my view is that in the COVID epidemic, we've devoted far too much resource to talking about these things and far too little to finding out what these, what these key parameters are. Frankly, in the investment world and the political world, the cost of getting better information is very small relative to the costs of making bad policies on the back of, on the basis of bad information or insufficient information. Yes, so actually that's more about as well the, the the issue of the people versus the numbers. That actually numbers in the hands of the wrong people or or insufficient numbers in the hands of people can cause some quite negative decisions. I mean, the, the balance that I'm always struggling with. Uh, as an observer and someone who's living through this, plus the fact that I'm educating, you know, generations of university students, is the balance between safety and the economy. Because everything I've ever read shows me that if we have a long and prolonged recession, that actually that will affect all kinds of healthcare outcomes, and um, and uh, and COVID will be one of a number of ways that we suffer. Um, and so I'm, you know, I'm very cautious about the fine line between just completely destroying the economy, which I think will cause all sorts of other problems in the future. Um, I mean, John, do you, do you think that, um, that people are 
treading that line with the right decisions and the right data or, or, or that they need to be looking elsewhere? Um, it's a very difficult line to tread, actually, that balance between uh, safety and um, economic benefit. And the point you've made, which is that uh, damaging the economy damages health uh, just as much as um, just as much as viruses damage health. And indeed, one of the big worries we have is the extent to which other treatments and other illnesses have been aggravated by the fact that we've focused attention on COVID and are just have been effectively discouraging people from seeking, seeking medical advice and postponing treatments. So that uh, an assessment of all these costs and benefits is very complicated and very difficult. Now, of course, we have a lot of cost benefit analysis, but I'm afraid a lot of that cost benefit analysis involves people making up all the numbers they don't know. We have a serious critique in the book, for example, of it's something of my bet noir in the way of models, something called web tag, which is what's used for appraising transport infrastructure problems in the UK. And people have made up thousands and thousands of numbers that go into the model you're, uh, you have to use. If you want to know how many passengers there will be a, in, on average in a car on Friday afternoons in 2036, there's a number for that. If you want to know what the British growth rate will be in 2080, there's a number for that. All this is what um, Hayek famously called it, the pretense of knowledge, the, the idea that you are, you are creating science by inventing numbers for things you don't know. And actually it's the opposite of science. So James, uh, coming to you now, I should say straight away for also our <coughs> audience that this is not um, a, a publicly open panel session. We're not running a QA. and a um, George mentioned at the beginning that um, if people should get their questions in early, but that he was referring to those sessions that are public panel sessions. Notwithstanding that, we have got one member of our audience who has managed to uh, secrete in a question to me. So, um, James, I, I have a, a question here that, um, that maybe you might consider in, in, when commenting on what John's just said about some of these, uh, you know, predict, predictive numbers that are nothing of the sort. Um, but you have in the past, James, in some of the things you've written, discussed deep transitions. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and the, the question is, you know, do you think we're entering um, an, a second deep transition? I, I genuinely do, Heather. Um, for background, we do a lot of work with a combination of Sussex and Utrecht universities on this, uh, informed by a lot by the work of the excellent veteran Venezuelan economist Carlos Perez. Um, and what seems truly unique to me, at the phase we're at, is that whereas really for the last 30 or 40 years, the one close certainty and real driver of our economies has been effectively Moore's laws law of the extra efficiency of semiconductors. We're now seeing this happening in more and more worlds. Um, one of the other academics we talk to a lot is Ian Morris, the ex-Cambridge archaeologist, who's now a professor of effectively of world history um, and thinking about the future at Stanford, which is what happens when you move from Cambridge to Stanford. I think you've changed that, 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 that nature. And one of the things he's been constantly pointing out to us is that pandemics are reasonably common, sadly, and for all the reasons that John alluded to earlier. Uh, Moore's law has been pretty persistent, but we're now entering a phase where you are having a complete revolution in energy supply. And to our and Ian's minds, you know, we've only had a very small number of those. We went from wood to coal, from coal to oil. Uh, and it's quite a lot of evidence that, you know, we meet, meet these productivity ceilings if you don't get improvements in energy. And I still find it amazing just how little thought and concentration were going on here, because, you know, I think this is remorseless. The word Ian Morris used to us was almost words were almost certain. And I don't think we're thinking through the implications. And I think it does apply to the type of forum we're in because, you know, it, it seemed to us that as an economic reality, that the oil industry, many of the associated industries like chemicals 
were pretty much doomed in economic terms well before people started thinking about that from the point of view of ESG, but also when people still regarded those companies because they were large in the index as risky. Um, you know, who would have dreamt so quickly that we would have an energy, a, a renewable energy utility in America worth more um, than Exxon or that Zoom would be worth as much as Exxon? Um, you know, I think these changes, in a sense, were predictable, but they are proof of a much deeper read. And, you know, it probably goes beyond what we can talk about here. But, you know, they will change the very nature of our society. And I think trying to understand the nature of what's going on in that transition, if you combine it with big data, uh, is really profound. And I would add in just as a last word on that. We're just beginning to see similar aided by big data, but by a better understanding of biology, uh, developments in healthcare, which surely would be a relief after the more for less that we've had, sorry, less for more that we've had over the last 10 years or 20 years of healthcare. So, you know, I think there are very, very profound changes going on. And I think it's our inability, partly because we use backward looking risk measures uh, to comprehend those, even though I think they're actually pretty high likelihoods. So, so just to uh, expand a little bit on that, um, particularly around the fact that the, you know, the, um, the the Chinese characters for crisis, as John Kennedy once famously quoted, you know, are, are separated between disaster and opportunity. You know? So a crisis is um, it's not good for many people, but but it also presents opportunities. And, so, and we're talking about this transition. Do you think that then presents a lot of opportunity? for people who have got to invest long-term money? Yeah, I, I think your, you know, your allusion to China is very interesting on this score because you know, when we talk to the major digital Chinese companies from Alibaba to Tencent to Meituan, Meituan is a food delivery company for those who, who don't know, um, they have quite consistently told us the course of our prior experiences with viruses and healthcare scares, that they think the whole system was better prepared to code this. You know, I think it had built in a degree of resilience, perhaps, and if I'm not misquoting John's thoughts on this, that, that, that really matter here. And I think, you know, you, you do get a read and it will be different uh, for different industries, different sectors, but on which societies are able to respond and to update their processes by this crisis. And I think, you know, some of them are showing an inability to react in that way, others aren't. And I think, you know, it is easier to discern who has that ability to react and to progress, if you like, it's a dangerous word, but I will use it, progress in these mm -hmm. times of crisis that you didn't at more normal um, times. Yes, John, so mentioning that, that bit about resilience, which I knew you also addressed in your book, I mean, what do you think that this, this whole crisis is going to show us then, you know, where the opportunities are and who's going to do better than others coming out of it? Um, I, th I, th I think it will certainly take us to thinking more effectively about resilience than we have in the, in the, last, year, in the last few years. Um, as I've been saying, the, uh, the things that uh, make strategies robust and resilient are things that people in business have tended to think of as symbols of inefficiency in the last few years and that the fallacy of that kind of thinking has been revealed rather starkly by the crisis the covid crisis but i think the transition james is talking about is not a transition that is generated by covid and the particular crisis we're going through at the moment it's a much longer term story and it's a much longer term story that comes from uh, the underlying technological determinants of what, of what has been happening. In the last 50 years, technological progress has basically been dominated by what's happening in information technology. In other areas of, um, uh, of life or business life, uh, not very much has happened. You know, we're still flying in planes that look very like the planes we were flying in 50 years ago. Um, we had uh, lots of new materials developed in the 50 years before the 1960s, 
very few subsequently. But what's happening now is that we're trying to understand, we're trying to see, being able to see the applications of information technology to things that superficially have nothing much to do with information technology. Autonomous vehicles, Tesla we were talking about earlier, are an example of that. What James was describing in healthcare is an example of that. And if we think back to foundational general purpose technologies in the past, that is what happened. In, initially, electricity was used for what was the obvious use of electricity? It was lighting things up. It took 50 years before people started to see that electricity uh, would make it easier to, to store data or to discover what had happened when people fractured their bones. Uh, th these are things that were developing related technologies that applied the general purpose technology in quite different areas. And that's, I think, what is going to be key to understanding what is going to happen in the next two or three de decades. And the healthcare and autonomous vehicle examples are just the, the start of what's happening. We haven't seen very much yet. Well, um, I think another part of resilience um, is about purpose. Certainly at Heriot Watt, we believe that students um, and indeed staff who are clearly able to articulate their purpose in life are likely to be more resilient and certainly all of the uh, literature and positive psychology suggests this. So we encourage um, people to define their purpose in life um, and be able to articulate it well. If, if anybody wants to see mine, for instance, you can go to my Twitter handle. I've made a little video of what I think my purpose in life is. Um, and if, if, that is, if the literature is right and, and um, organisations or people with purpose are more resilient, then in theory, and, and bearing in mind the conference that we are at that, that's looking at ethical and impact investing, um, it, you know, maybe it's the case that organisations with purpose will be more resilient as well as people with purpose. Um, James, do you think that organisations that have a goal, that have a feel that they have, are out to change the world, um, you know, are those kinds of places that will succeed in the future? Oh, I think we might have lost James. From a technical point of view. John, can you hear me? Uh, uh, right. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, but we've lost James, I think. So we better just get you to comment on... Okay, John, would you like to comment on purpose and resilience and whether companies that have purpose will be more resilient in your view? Uh, absolutely. I mean, it's uh, 50 years uh, since Milton Friedman wrote The Social Responsibility of Businesses to Maximise Its Profits. And I think 50 years is a time at which we can draw a line under that particular, um, uh, under that particular uh, issue. As um, if we take the, the kind of companies James has been talking about, great companies which make lots of value for shareholders have always been companies which were driven by people whose objective was to create great businesses. That's what Tesla is about, that's what um, Illumina is about, that's what all the kind of companies uh, that we're talking about in this kind of area uh, are for. And when Bill Gates and Paul Allen set up Microsoft, when Steve Jobs got involved with Apple, uh, when people when Jeff Bezos started selling books online. What all these people were trying to do was not to say, I think I can create a lot of shareholder value this, this way. What they're trying to do uh, was to develop a new kind of retailing, to make computers available to everyone uh, and to make computers that people could put in, in, in their pocket. It was that kind of vision that drove the, the development of the business. And incidentally, it made a great deal of money for investors along the way. James, we lost you a little bit there um, from a technical point of view, but I hope you're back with us now. And we were just discussing whether company, as we're coming to the end of our session and also mindful of the fact that we are talking into a, in, in a part of an event that is looking at ethical investing and impact investing, you know, do you think that companies that have purpose are likely to be more resilient um, and are therefore you know, more attractive investable opportunities? 
It, uh, uh, absolutely. I, I probably mostly would emphasize the resilience slightly less, though I think it's certainly there. But I think they are both fundamentally, as John elucidated, likely to create value, but also that actually they are absolutely the ones that are in line with our beliefs on, on this score, the, the institution we're, we're, we're talking to. Um, you know, I, I would go further than purpose. I think it's very often mission. Um, so to take two very brief examples on that, um, for all his unusual personality traits, Elon Musk is absolutely clear that what he is doing is trying to solve the most difficult problem facing the world, by which he means climate change. And I think that he has advanced the cause of that very significantly by a number, quantifiable number of years, probably. Um, similarly, we were earlier this week on the phone to Illumina, uh, which as people probably know is the main sequencing company for understanding our DNA. They're just making an acquisition of an associated company, uh, which does liquid biopsies to be able to identify cancer at very early stages. What the CEO of Lumen said was not, we think we will make the share price go a lot by that. What he said to us was, we think we can make more of a contribution to solving cancer and hence solving lives than the all the other approaches to oncology have done in the past. Now, isn't that both ethical and a good thing in almost every definition beyond Milton Friedman? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, it, it, it has been a, um, a for me, a, you know, a, a great privilege and um, and an education as well. Uh, and I hope that all of the people watching um, have enjoyed hearing uh, th th these views. Um, I'm sure you've got many of your own. There are some open panel sessions later on today. Um, in the meantime, um, I'm just going to invite my panelists to make last comments and then we will be handing back to the organisers. So um, James, can I just again ask you, is there anything you would like to say to people before we leave on, on this very important subject um, of radical uncertainty? Oh, I, I, very briefly. We can do a better job, Heather, if we know that extremes happen and we invest trying to think about those extremes and those extremes in investment terms can often be about huge upsides. So, yeah, yeah, it's really important. And, and John, I do, I, we hope the book is going very well. Thank you very much for, for you and Mervyn for writing it and, and, and in such a timely way as well. Um, and is there a last message that you'd like to, to leave us with on radical? The last message would be manage risk. And if you manage risk, you can enjoy uncertainty. Excellent. Thank you very much, everybody. It's been a great privilege to be here.